uh, participants for joining us. We're going to be talking about um, uh, new methods to record BEM. You are currently uh, working as an associate professor, Reader, am I right? In audiology yes. in the Department of uh, Audiology in India Institute of Speech and Hearing. I, I will leave you the floor and just remind you that at the last five minutes, we'll leave it for a question. Thank you. May I start? Yes, thank you. Uh, so, the topic that I'm going to be discussing is uh, new methods of recording WAM. Uh, truthfully, more, uh, some of them are really new methods, but what one criteria that they do fulfill is new methods of recording WAM. So some, were, uh, some studies were done in 2003, some are in 2009, but I will discuss a lot of studies that we have undertaken. Some of them are currently being done and some of them are already published. So uh, overall, I'll be talking about, uh, first I'll start off with the binaural recording of WAMPs, both for CWAMP and OWAMP. Then I'll talk about the simultaneous CWAMP and OWAMP recording using monaural stimulation and also using binaural stimulation. I'll also talk about an interesting modified oddball paradigm that, uh, that we have published on uh, uh, for uh, finding out frequency tuning. And uh, I'll also be talking about uh, the simultaneous multi-frequency uh, WAMPs, both for C-WAMP and O-WAMP. So, uh, binaural C-WAMPs, uh, first of all, we should think, why did we ever think about binaural C-WAMP? Simply because if you do, Two, two CWAMPs, that is one for right ear and one for left ear, it takes double the amount of time. Now, why is it possible to record it binaurally? Because if you look at a lot of audiological tests, do not have, uh, uh, or do not allow you, or even if you do binaural recording for a lot of audiological tests, what happens is there is some summation effect which occurs because of the brainstem. However, for CWAMP, the pathways are, the pathway for right side CWAMP and for the left side CWAMP actually do not overlap and they do not get added up anywhere. So what we get is an ipsilateral response and there is hardly any uh, contribution from the contralateral connections. So therefore it is possible to get the two year responses separately despite one. Now this is possible because you have to give a stimulus which is binaural. So we have to give stimulus from both ears. And supports this. That means you should have a two uh, channel equipment that will allow you to do this. Now the major change that occurs is invariably when we do a, uh, when we do a CVM recording, we are all used to doing by making the patient sit up right and uh, turn the head in one direction so that you stimulate this SCM muscle on one side. However, here we need a stimulation of SCM muscle on both sides. So you need to change the position and the position change would be either you make the patient lie down and ask him to lift the heads up slightly, which will stimulate or which will activate both the sides SCM muscles, or you can make, you can do a semi reclining position from where the patient could raise head. The electrodes will be placed on both sides. So you will have the non inverting electrode being placed on the uh, SCM muscle belly, generally about one third of the way down from the asteroid and you will have the inverting electrode being placed at the uh, uh, at the sternoclavicular junction where the muscle inserts into the clavicular bone and the ground electrode will be placed oh, at the, cool. place the electro, ground electrode at any other place as well. So uh, this study was done by Wang and Yang. I, am, I have no contribution to this study but uh, I just want to start off with this study because this was the first study which showed that you can do a binaural recording and uh, you can save time while doing WEMPs. Because remember, the part so of yeah. the vestibular test battery and you will do a lot of other tests in vestibular assessment. So therefore, wherever it is possible, we should save time. And that's precisely the reason why we want to save time. And in fact, a lot of people work in private clinics. So time is money for them. So wherever you can save time, that means you're saving some money or you're earning extra money. So this uh, Wang, uh, Wang and Yang in 2003, 
what they did is they had uh, they did uh, binaural CVMs, and you can see these are the responses from healthy individuals. So you can see for binaural as well as for the monaural recording, both the right and the left ear responses seem very very similar. They also wanted to see whether the same works in individuals with pathologies or not. So they have taken individuals with unilateral meniere's disease, and in individuals with unilateral meniere's disease, you can see that both the binaural as well as the monaural sequential monaural recordings produce similar kind of result that means in the unaffected year the response was present for both and in the affected year the response was absent for both so based on this they concluded uh, they concluded that there was no significant difference between monaural and binaural cvms in healthy individuals there was also no significant difference in meniere's disease however that means basically to say that both of them are replicas of each other or both of them uh, can be replaced one can be replaced by the other but binaural does save you time and it would be less effortful in cases uh, where uh, uh, in cases like uh, uh, elderly or maybe children so in those in those kind of cases it will save you time and it will be less effortful so it it should be preferred now the binaural recording can also be done for ovems but some people might be thinking those who at least know basics of ovm you will know that there is also a weak ipsilateral connection and therefore you get both ovms for ipsilateral as well as contralateral but need to remember that the crossed pathway is a lot stronger and much more robust and the uncrossed that is the ipsilateral pathway is uh, is less robust and it it has got very it produces very feeble amplitudes when we record uh, ovms so again stimulus presentation like the previous study will be a binaural stimulus presentation and you need a two channel recording but here the trick is you remember you need to remember which is the ear you are stimulating and where you are recording response from there it was simple right and right uh, right response but here remember when we stimulate the right ear we get the response from the left eye electrodes placed under the left eye so always remember to compare the contralateral responses so when you give a stimulus to the right ear remember take the second channel recording for that and when you give a stimulus to the left ear take first channel recording for that so that way you will remember or depending upon how you have assigned the channels but remember it will be a contralateral response because this could be confusing sometimes when especially when you get a unilateral uh, pathology in that case you don't know which one is present now you should start you will start thinking whether am i getting an opposite response so this was a dissertation done under me by sojanya sojanya jatirtha so in 2014 and uh, we had done uh, uh, this binaural ovms so these are the uh, over overlapping and grand averaged responses so you can see this is for right monaural right binaural left monaural and left binaural and practically just looking at the grand averaged waveforms you can realize that there is no significant difference between monaural recording and binaural recording however there was one thing that we observed there was in terms of the asymmetry ratio we found that the asymmetry ratio when doing a binaural recording was nearly 5% lesser than the asymmetry ratio for monaural recording even in healthy individuals now why would that happen is because when you are when you are doing a binaural recording you are recording responses from electrodes under both eyes so when there is a gaze elevation it is same for both ears when you do sequential recording what can happen is i may be sitting up uh, upright straight like this so at that time when i'm given a target the angle will be different whereas after some time when i become slightly more collapsed in the chair the angle of gaze elevation will increase and therefore that will change the response between the two sides there is a probability i am not saying it will always happen but there is a probability and this is what we think when you do it, it simultaneously then that's not likely to occur because whatever effect happens it happens on both so if the person is collapsed in the chair then the gaze elevation is more but between years it will remain the same because at the same time we are recording from both sides so that that's an added advantage plus we also did it in pathological cases so we had uh, uh, meniere's disease patients who were unilateral uh, meniere's disease they were all definite meniere's disease and we also had unilateral posterior canal bpp patients so we know that in posterior canal bpp ovms can be affected 
so that's why we chose those two population and when we compared between them if you can see this is i don't know the fonts are really small so i don't know how much you can see but uh, i'll just quickly describe this is the amplitude in healthy individuals and this is the asymmetry ratio in healthy individuals and this is the amplitude in minus uh, that means in the clinical population both minus and bv and this is the asymmetry ratio in the clinical population so what we found is the amplitudes when compared to the healthy individuals were actually reduced in the affected years of pathological population so here we did not write right or left year we just took the affected year and unaffected year so irrespective of whether right year was affected or left year was affected it goes to the affected side so we found that the amplitudes were lesser now we also found the same thing for asymmetry ratio and here what i want you to realize is monaural and binaural are both in the same uh, one what i want you to realize is in the clinical population if you look at this uh, scale over here it is it should be roughly about 55% okay so the scales are different that's why just looking at those two here it is uh, just 30% okay so the because of the difference in scales they don't look different but statistically they were significantly different so that means to say that both binaural and monaural whatever monaural gave the same kind of results binaural uh, recording of ovms also gave but because it saved time it is always better that we do something which saves time for us then we also wanted to see okay there may be a chance that in the binaural when we do a ovm maybe it is a contribution because you have a trilateral connection also so a, a more uh, better way could be when you don't have uh, you take responses where there is no chance of an interaction so if i do cvm and ovm at the same time is it possible it is possible because your cvm is a trilateral response ovm is a contralateral response cvm is produced from saccule ovm is produced from utricle so like that if you think in terms of the neural uh, pathway also the cvm is carried along the inferior nerve ovm is carried along the superior nerve the ovm follows a utricle ocular pathway so it goes to the ocular muscles whereas cvm follows after the uh, vestibular nuclei it follows the descending pathway which is the spinal path so it takes the medial medio vestibular spinal tract and uh, goes down into the scm muscle so that means the pathway is entirely different so if the pathway is different and when we stimulate it is possible to stimulate both utricle and saccule by the same acoustic stimuli it is possible that we do cvm and ovm simultaneously so the difference here would be if you look at the electrode placement you will place the contralateral electrodes under the uh, you will place the electrodes for ovm under the contralateral eye and the electrode for cvm under the Uh, on the scm muscle on the same side where you are going to give stimulus and the person must turn away from the uh, cvm electrode side that means if you are stimulating right the person must turn left so what that will do is stimulate the scm muscle and to activate the gaze that is to activate the inferior oblique muscle i ask the person to gaze upwards look upwards where i can put a target so the person will turn and look up so that way you will stimulate both the muscles simultaneously so when we did that we found that you can see that uh, between the separate and simultaneous there was practically no difference they were very very similar on all regards so therefore this is definitely a very useful technique we thought okay we can do a cvm binaural we can do a ovm binaural we can do simultaneous cvm and ovm can we do all of them together because this is likely to save us a lot more time so it is feasible simply because again cvm and ovm i have just explained they are very different so the pathways are very different and the ovm and the cvm on both sides are also almost separate except for that little contribution that may arise for ovm from the ipsilateral path otherwise they are practically very different so the only prerequisite here is you need an equipment which provides you to which needs you to have a facility for four channel recording so if you have four channels your two channels will record two ovms and your other two channels will record two cvms the only thing we again must need to remember is the protocol slightly vary so in their different channels you set the protocols appropriately so we did uh, do this study this is under review it's not yet published but i'm sharing with you people so 
we found that, as you can see, for separate and for binaural stimuli for right and separate and binaural stimuli for left, practically there looks no difference at all. If you have to see very minutely to realize that those waveforms are different from each other, they are not copies of each other. And uh, the same thing for CVAMP also uh, for both sides. So, and when we did statistical analysis, we found that there was no significant difference between binaural simultaneous and sequential separate recordings. But what will happen in sequential separate recordings is you will do four recordings. So you will do a 500 Hertz OVAMP, a 500 Hertz CVAMP for right side. Then you will do a 500 Hertz OVAMP and a 500 Hertz CVAMP for left side. So you will have four recordings. If you do this way, you will do it all at once. So all four recordings in the same amount of time that would be required for uh, uh, in you, uh, that would be required uh, if you if you do it for uh, four different ones it will require four times more amount of time so and when we did it in pathological cases we found that it was giving the same result as the separate recordings were giving then i'm very excited to talk about this one which is uh, a noble uh, paradigm that we that we that we made uh, mainly because of frequency tuning because with whatever monaural simultaneous recordings and all that we i have spoken about till now you can only do one single frequency response there now a lot of times nowadays uh, frequency tuning has uh, really uh, evolved and a lot of people are using frequency tuning to identify cases with menius disease to identify the involvement of endolymphatic high drops in vestibular migraine cases. That's mainly because the ratio of 1000 Hertz to 500 Hertz uh, response increases in case there is an endolymphatic high drops. Now we really don't have time to go into details of why that happens and that could be for a separate seminar altogether. But that's the reason why we are using frequency tuning or I like to call it as inter uh, Interfrequency amplitude ratio because it basically is not frequency tuning, even though it depends upon the principle of frequency tuning. But it is actually the ratio of two uh, responses corresponding to two different frequencies. So the interfrequency amplitude ratio is actually a much more appro appropriate terminology. And in all my publications, I like to use that terminology. So uh, Therefore, uh, what we need is a 500 Hertz response and a 1000 Hertz response. Now, how do we do that? The simple logic I thought is if I can use the odd well paradigm that is used for recording of P300 or MMN and for the, say for example, for infrequent, I assign 500 Hertz and for frequent, I assign 1000 Hertz. And if I change the ratio to one is to one, then when I present the stimulus, what will happen is 500,000, 500,000, 500,000, like this, the responses will, the stimuli will be presented alternately. And because the trigger is already there in the instrument, I will get the two responses separately. So I'll get a 500 Hertz response separately and a thousand Hertz response separately. This will happen in the same amount of time that I will, uh, uh, that I will need to your probably lesser amount of time. So that is what happened. This shows you here in this, uh, you can see 1000 Hertz, it says MoVEM. So basically it is modified OVEM and 1000 Hertz CoVEM, which is uh, conventional OVEM. Okay, so we have done both uh, conventional and the modified oddball paradigm. And uh, what we found is the latencies, the amplitude, the interfrequency amplitude ratios, all of that were very comparable between MoVEM and CoVEM. However, when we looked at the test retest reliability, we found that the MoVEM produced a much better test retest reliability than the CoVEM. Now the logic remains the same. Remember when you do a CoVEM that is conventional, so you will do a 500 and a thousand. So when you're doing 500, the gaze angle, if it differs from what you're doing, what gaze angle is there when you're doing thousand, <coughs> excuse me. So at that time, what will happen is it will produce a difference. Now at one time it happens and at the other time it doesn't happen, then it is likely to produce a difference in the IFAR between the two recordings. When you do a MOVEM, because both of them are being recorded one after the other continuously, simultaneously, even during recording, if the person collapses in the chair or raises the gaze more or reduces, reduces the gaze, it is likely to affect both the potentials in the same way. So the IFAR, irrespective of when you record, it really doesn't change. 
and that's why we found better test to test reliability and we also found that this was very useful and it was more time saving okay this shows i know you can you think only 70 seconds versus about 50 seconds but what i want you to realize is this is without preparation time this is only the test duration so that's why it is that much so while both of them produce comparable results because there is better test 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 reliability of more web and it is more reliable and it is less time consuming i would rather prefer and do it that way and most of the commercially available equipments do have this facility so it's very easy to do it we also came up with an idea and i wouldn't say this is my original idea we have a colleague of mine dr sandeep uh, in the department and he did something like this for recording abr and when i heard his presentation in one of the conferences i felt this may, this may be much more useful in vamps can we record all frequencies because when we do frequency tuning we record responses for 250 500 750 1k 1.5k 2k 3k 4k and uh, this was the uh, not the same fee my topic was my topic for thesis was frequency tuning of ovm and on 222 subjects when i did so many frequencies in both years it i had a nightmare of a time doing my data data collection so this really struck me and i thought if i can record simultaneously i can do it so quickly so what we did is we generated these different tone bursts in prat we calibrated them, we stitched them together as a chain by providing at least a 40 millisecond interstimulus interval because we sh that interstimulus in interval should be sufficient for the OVM response to that particular frequency getting recorded within that duration. So that's why a 40 millisecond inter in interstimulus interval. And we had to go to a slightly lower rate because you have so many stimuli, it requires longer time. So if the epoch is 390 seconds, obviously you can't record at 5 hertz. So therefore we recorded at 2.7 hertz. But this is only, the, the repetition rate comes down by half. So that means you require only double the time. But remember how many frequencies are you recording at the same time. So that means it is definitely time saving. Now let's look at the clinical aspect of it. When we, uh, uh, when we looked at the frequency tuning in normals, we found that it was at 750 hertz in this subject. In many subjects, we got it at 500 hertz. Uh, we know that it, it varies between 750 and 500 in, uh, in a few individuals. So in both sessions, we found the same. In session one, it was 750. In session two, also it was 750. Whatever was the ratio between 500 and 1000 in one session, the same ratio remained between between those two in the second session also. So effectively, it gave us a much better test to test reliability of frequency tuning. And that is shown by the ICC value of 0.97 that we got in comparison to sequential recording where we got an ICC value of 0.9. And this is not for amplitudes. This is for the frequency tuning. That means in session one, if I got a frequency tuning of 500, in session two also, I got 500. So in that, in that regard, it is that much. In terms of the clinical population, this is in a, in a patient with unilateral Meniere's disease. Now you can see this is the non Meniere's here, where you can clearly see that the ratio between 500 and 1K is definitely near to one, or it, it should be a little less than one. And 750 Hertz is the frequency which is, to which it is tuned. Whereas in Meniere's ears, you find that at 1K is the largest amplitude. So it shows you that the frequency tuning is at 1K and the amplitude at 500 hertz is much smaller than 1k so it goes with the ifar and it shows that okay frequency tuning can be done using this way in the same paper we also had bppv years because we wanted to see okay is what i go the variable so therefore we had bppv years also and in bppv years there is no reason for us to think that the frequency tuning will shift so that's what we found in the bppv and normal years the frequency tuning was majorly at 500 or 750 whereas in the miniers years it was at one kilohertz in most of the individuals and it was about 80 percent sensitivity for sequential recording 98 percent specificity for sequential recording whereas simfi produced 90 percent sensitivity and 100 percent specificity so it produces better sensitivity and comparable specificity that is clearly shown by the roc curves this roc curve is for simfi whereas this is for the sequential recording or conventional recording 
We also have tried the same thing in um, the SIMFI modality for CVM. Now, this is a preliminary data. We have only done it on a few individuals. But just looking at the waveform, I'm sure you feel it is very encouraging. You can see the 500 hertz response is generally the largest one in a normal individual. And 250 hertz is really small. And as you move higher up in frequency, it goes on becoming smaller and smaller. And it is very, very similar between the two years also. So if you use this method, what it gives you is you can get the IFAR, you can get the frequency tuning, and you just take 500 hertz response of the two sides and compare what you get is an asymmetry ratio also. So while doing just one single recording on either side, in just about uh, uh, <coughs> double the time for single recording of single frequency response, you are able to get the responses of all kinds. And you can use a, use a simple algorithm or just an Excel sheet to calculate the latency because you only have to subtract the pre-stimulus interval. You only have to subtract the pre-stimulus interval from the actual peak and you will keep getting. So for this peak, this, this minus the pre-stimulus interval of that. So like that, you will get the latencies also. So this will give you everything. So that's why I am I'm so fond of this technique and we, are, we have started to use it clinically in our department. So uh, I was told that I'm, I'm supposed to finish my presentation in 30 minutes. I have finished it in 28 minutes. So there is plenty of time for me to take questions and uh, uh, I'm, I'm ready to take questions. But before that, I would uh, thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to, to talk about uh, uh, these new paradigms that a lot of us we have developed and uh, some of us we have advanced some of it we have advanced so i'll be happy to take up any questions if they are there okay sure uh, first of all let me thank you for a very nice well organized presentation you have full participant load you should be very proud of what you just presented i received a private question which i'm going to read um someone is asking do you have any doubt that the sacule uh, when we're doing bilateral in intervention, we'll, we'll likely most, what I'm trying to say is that with the second was with the inferior and posterior or superior and inferior vestibular nerve intervention may have an effect on your testing. So when you're re the binaural recording, is it with the record? Yes, with binaural recording, recording yes. No, see the the sacular the sacule uh, the major supply from the sacule is the inferior vestibular nerve, which goes to the vestibular nuclei, and from there it takes the descending pathway that is the medial vestibulospinal tract, and it, the, it inserts into the SCM muscle. So that okay. pathway is very very different from the pathway from the utricle. So when you do a OVM, you are stimulating the utricle, and from there it goes via the superior vestibular nerve to the vestibular nuclei. And from there, along the MLF and along the abducens and the trochlear nerve and all, it goes to the different uh, extra auricular muscles. So therefore, the pathway is completely different. I don't see how there could be an interaction between the two. And statistically, we didn't find a difference. We have done the study. We've done it in pathologies. Mm -hmm. And we didn't find a difference between when we did, uh, simul uh, when we did uh, simultaneously for both years and when we do, uh, sorry, so when we did simultaneously CVM and OVM, and we didn't, when we did them separately. I mean, okay. we have done it in, fact, uh, in one of my publications in ergonomics in 2014. Uh, we, uh, we had published, we, we had used this technique and published this data in individuals with motion sickness. And it clearly showed us wherever there were asymmetries, it showed us there. Now for that study, we recorded for both sequential and simultaneous, just in case something goes wrong, we will, uh, use the other data but individually when i compared also i didn't find a difference perfect someone is asking what equipment do you use uh we have uh, lots of equipments here <laughs> we are spoiled choices actually at all india institute of speech and hearing uh, we have got uh, three different equipment but a lot of waveforms that you saw was from biologic mm -hmm. used biologic uh, for some of the studies we have used uh, the ihs intelligent hearing system mm -hmm. and uh, we also have uh, the Neurosoft um, system, so we get more regularly now. Have you tried, this is a personal question, have you tried using, I know 
it, it, uh, what, I'm, what I'm going to say is most probably a project for later on. Have you tried to compare uh, performing uh, OVAMP uh, with BC and not AC and then compare? Uh, truthfully, no, because most of these equipments, the BC that comes with a, uh, with a commercially available equipment, the outputs are only limited to about 61 to 63 dB force levels. And that Can amplify level them. Not, sorry? I personally amplify them. Yeah, but uh, we do, in the commercially available equipments, we don't have mm, okay. that facility. At least the equipments that we have, we don't have it. Uh, I tried doing with B81. Uh, because B81 mm -hmm. might claim that you can connect it to anything and do it, mm -hmm. but uh, it didn't. It didn't work. The output was still that much only. So I, I don't have too much of experience of working with BC amps. Uh, because I, uh, the reason why is where we found only 50% people had response, but that was mainly because you, of the lower levels that were the output levels that were low. Because in children, I find BC to be very easy, and if you're giving me a way to actually in, the, like I know you're, you're giving me a solution or giving everyone a solution to cut time in clinic and when I have a child that is agitated that would be the perfect reason but what I found is that personally this is personal observation nothing officially like when I'm trying to do ACO vamp on children it's it takes more time than actually running a BC again this is most probably projects for later on to discuss I guess okay we have more two more Thank questions you can check them on um, a one, uh, okay, one question, I apologize. Um, how much simul uh, simultaneous testing is effective in geriatric population where muscle tension is an issue to be considered? Uh, truthfully, we, uh, I mean, you, I know we, we do see response rates uh, going down, but uh, I, what we have tried is when we give a EMG target level and if the if uh, the client is able to meet that EMG target level, most often we don't have a problem. So uh, with the Neurosoft or with the IHS, we have a EMG target that can be set. And once we've set the target, we don't find a problem. But yes, we do see uh, a f uh, quite a few individuals in whom we don't get a response, but that's uh, that, that one of the reasons my Hello? Hello? Do we have any more questions? Do you mind just repeating this question, this answer, because we lost you for a bit? Oh, really? I'm sorry. It's yeah, okay. I will repeat. Uh, so, uh, what, what happens is uh, we have seen a few individuals, few elderly individuals in whom we don't get a response. And uh, a lot of times they are actually slightly symptomatic. I mean, if you, if you, if you put them on a foam surface or a, mm -hmm. or a that uh, that requires a lot of uh, 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 balancing, uh, you will see that uh, they don't give you the appropriate uh, uh, response there. And in those people, we find more of it to be absent. But yes, muscle tension can affect. And what we do is we we give EMG targets. So we give a EMG target of say 30 to 70. Now, if they're able to reach within that EMG target. Usually the VEMS, uh, if they are absent, then we know it is absent because of a vestibular region, a reason. And if it is, uh, if, we, if they are not able to reach the target, then, then we cannot uh, say with any degree of confidence as to why it is absent. It may be absent because of the reduced muscle tension, but it, it may also be absent uh, because of uh, a vestibular pathology. One last question I guess we're going to take was when it comes to doing CVAMP and OVAMP simultaneously, isn't it harder for the patient to do both tasks at the same time and focus on them? Uh, it, it is, it is. I have no doubt about it. And uh, uh, in such cases, what we, norm, what we normally do is I have tried this and I'm, that's why I'm telling you the target itself, the, the visual target for OVAMP what I do is I, I, I raise the laptop mm -hmm. to a level and put it on the side where there's a patient is supposed to turn. So okay. say patient is on this side and looks up. So I have the laptop screen itself where the EMG target is there. That as the 
target to focus. So you, he only has to focus for CVAMP maintenance of muscle tension, not worry about the uh, visual target. That makes it easy. Okay. I have one last question, if possible, if you don't mind. Yes, please. Okay, so the question says the following. If there are some instruments that only have option to do CVAMP or OVAMP at the time, how do you suggest that they perform these tests sim simultaneously? So are you running it on a research module? Are you running it on two channels? Well, what are you doing? Lot, set up? Uh, yeah, I, I understood the question. Uh, see, a lot of uh, things that I've shown here were actually not on web modules. What I do is I have an ABR module and modify it. Exactly. So if the at least allows you to modify that, say you can change the epoch, you can change the filter set. If if it allows you to modify that, you just modify it. I know for sure that um, I just I don't mean to talk about um, brands or anything, but I know and uh, I use an Eclipse 25 EP25. I have a research module. I bought the extra research module, and it's exactly what you're saying. I can create whatever I want set up with it. So if someone is using an ABR equipment, they all they have to do is change the setup. Exactly. By the way, do you have it uh, uh, published in any? Um, any article, what is the exact setup you're using? So this way we can refer to our, uh, to our audience to this exact. Um, yeah, uh, one of the papers that I showed was published. That is published in American Journal of Audiology in 2019. That is the MoWEMP and OWEMP using the MMN paradigm. Okay, so most published. part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if uh, you don't most mind. of the others are under review. Mm -hmm. uh, they are under review in very reputed journals and they have gone through one or two stages. So. Hopefully sometimes towards the end of 2020 or maybe 2021, you should see them published. Hopefully. So what we're going to do is just for everyone to benefit the most, I'm going to try to publish this, these articles that you just mentioned on the forum, the Audiology Vestibular Forum. So this way everyone can have access to reading it. Yeah, the MoVEMP, COVEMP, definitely I can put it on the Perfect. forum. I think the discussion long back, Dr. Eleftherios, so he, he had brought it up mm -hmm. saying that done something which is very encouraging so but in any Great. case i can we can i can i can send it to you you can post it perfect thank you again time is up i just want to thank you one more time and thank everyone for joining us thank you sir thank you so much have a nice day me. everyone